<laughs> Welcome everyone to this third session of the AI in the Classroom series. Uh, for those that are new, or if this is your first session with us, we're going to be exploring the understanding of AI literacy and the impacts of AI on media education by discussing the benefits as well as the challenges brought on by AI's growing presence in the classroom. So as we go through these conversations, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat uh, and also use the chat as a way to ask questions, participate in the discussion, and feel free to also use the raise hand function. And you're, we welcome you to join on camera or off mute during the interactive portions of these sessions as well. So in our last session, Michelle talked with us about what goes into AI tools and how media literacy can help us critically question AI produced content, as well as the tools themselves. And in this third session, we'll go a little bit deeper into that. Pamela Morris and Scott Moss are going to help us explore what it means to be AI literate. So Pamela L. Morris is an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Indiana University, Columbus, specializing in media studies and new media. She worked previously as a programmer and project manager in IT and received her PhD in communication from Purdue University in Media, Technology, and Society. Scott Moss is a doctoral candidate at UCLA's Educational Leadership Program, and he works as an Instructional Technology Outreach Coordinator in, at the U Los Angeles County Office of Education. So Pamela and Scott, I'll hand it to you. Thank you so much for leading this session. Please take it away. Hello, I'm Pamela, and um, kind of our goal today is to spend a, a good portion of our time talking amongst each other because that's been sort of the um, the call in a lot of these sessions is give us more time to talk, give us more time to talk. Uh, we're not going to answer the question of what AI literacy is. We're going to ask you to help us answer that question. Um, so I think we were briefly introduced, but um, apparently I can't. Okay. Um, I, she's already gave my information about me, um, but Scott, why don't you want to introduce yourself a little bit more? Uh, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I've been uh, working in uh, a K-12 education for about 30 years. And it just uh, kind of broadly, if I were going to split that up, uh, 10 years teaching elementary, 10 years teaching middle school, and 10 years um, in out of the classroom capacities, uh, like my current uh, position as a technology coordinator at the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Um, I've been very focused on uh, media literacy, but also on computer science. And now I see AI literacy as kind of a kind of a, a blending or a synthesis of the two. And um, I guess I guess that's it about me. Okay, thank you, Scott. And I was very glad to to team up with Scott on this. It's something I've been looking at for probably at least the past year. Yeah. Um, and Scott, as a and a near as a doctoral candidate is working on on some ideas along the way as well. Um, so we're going to start out with just a very quick um, review of terms to kind of put us on the same page. So I'll do some, and Scott will do some. Um, but we don't want to take up too much of your time. We'll make this available um, for anybody who you know wants some of these. So literacy. I think it's important for us to go back to remembering that literacy involves more than just reading. It's reflective, critical, and integrative. Um, it under, it's about understanding and communicating. So whether we call anything um, as an adjective before literacy, we have to remember that literacy is very rich. Um, media literacy, our, our typical definition is access, analyze, evaluate, and even exclusively with, with digital media. Um, and it's important that this includes, as we know as educators, more than just technical skills, um, but also cognitive skills that are needed. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Scott to just kind of put us into the um, sort of solar system of AI. Okay. Uh, the term algorithm is in a very uh, general sense is kind of any, doesn't necessarily have to do with digital technology. Uh, commonly when we teach about algorithms, we start with something like a recipe um, that's got an input processing and an output. Um, but we, when we talk about algorithms these days, it's usually digital algorithms, right? Uh, machine learning um, is kind of really what it sounds like, is machines that have, through trial and error, and um, uh, can teach itself uh, certain rules and, and generate certain outputs. Uh, the, big, the big talk right now, of course, is generative AI, um, beginning, I think, with ChatGPT, which was released in late November of last year, and I think we're all familiar with that by now, and that is AI that can kind of generate 
uh, new content based on uh, large language models or other very, very large data sets. And uh, what's called weak AI is a, a kind of a simulation of human intelligence uh, through computer systems. I'm reading now technology that mimics human intelligence to perform tasks such as problem solving and decision making. Yeah, and I wanted to, um, the differentiation with that is that strong AI is the science sci-fi sort of version of sentient AI that can actually do more things and react to emotions. And that is at this point, theoretical only. Um, so when we say AI today, we're really talking about algorithms that are very particularly tuned to do a certain task and they can do those tasks very well. Okay. And, um, so I wanna kind of open it up to either in the chat or you can talk on your microphone is why, why do we need to come up with AI literacy? Like what are the reasons that we're paying close attention to this? Well, we have to deal with it because it's here already and uh, getting ahead of us. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you, Terry. That's a very good point. Um, we're already in the middle of it. Okay. And Judy says it's going to impact every facet of our lives. That's absolutely right. We're seeing it in the workplace. We're seeing it in education, um, medical. Um, it impacts just about every area of our lives. Anything new needs a roadmap. I love that, Lena. That's absolutely true. Otherwise, we're going to be lost. I also think that... Um... You know, because of algorithmic personalization and all those things that, you know, there are, there are intelligences, artificial intelligence that work in ways that we don't, that are not even transparent. We really need to move understanding of this from the sort of functional work related field to the more social historical field and, and discuss democracy and participation and choices and all of those things. There was so much in what you said. I love the idea you said that it's not transparent and that's one of the, the big things I think. Um, but yes, um, we've got a technical understanding but we also have to look at it from a societal aspect as well. Um, the territory keeps changing, says Scott, definitely. Informed decisions about it, yes. Um, rather than letting AI take us on its path, we need to try to harness it the way we'd like. Um, we're concerned about it in our teaching, definitely. So I kind of, uh, here's my list. Um, and here's one of the words that, oh, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, please, please go ahead. I didn't see your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, one of the risks that I just ran across actually yesterday uh, was in an article from the New York Times, was the risk that people will trust it too much. Yes. And uh, they were talking about the, uh, downside, you know, they were talking about hallucinations, which are basically when AI kind of makes up references and other things that are not real. And they were saying that there was a risk of making it better because as it got better, people would trust it more. And then the mistakes that it made would be really potentially harmful, and medical, and a lot of other decision-making contexts. And it occurred to me that this is sort of a little bit like the uncanny valley where you know, if robots get kind of close to being like human, but not quite, it creates a very disturbing phenomenon. And also uh, in autonomous driving situations where if the car doesn't do too much, then you know you have to pay attention. But if it starts approaching doing a lot, then people stop paying attention. And that, unless it's flawless, that becomes very dangerous. So I think we're kind of in that situation. Exactly. Very many brilliant things. Thank you, Jeffrey. Daniela? Hi, hello. I was just thinking about what Jeffrey said, that the problem and the risk of people trusting everything. But I, I also think that there is another risk that we don't trust anything at all because we are so afraid of everything. So I think the, the both sides are very, very... Uh, challenging for us. I'm writing down trust really big on my my pad here because that's something I want to incorporate. Definitely. Thank you, Jeff and Danella, for that. Um, so, uh, AI is AI is pervasive. It's everywhere. It's opaque right now. A lot of people and 
probably maybe people who are not technical maybe don't really understand what's going on in that black box. It is complex. It's also protected by a lot of trade secrets. So even if they wanted to tell us, they wouldn't. Um, people talked about a new kind of digital divide, and I think this goes along with what Jeffrey said about trust. Um, you've got people who will be used by AI versus people who will use AI, and I think we want to become the latter. Um, relevant to me, I want to be able to sort of measure how well I'm teaching it, and in order, I need a definition and, and in order to measure it. And we, of course, want to enable ourselves to control and empower versus having it do the other. And of course, you know, we need to develop some ethical standpoints about this. Um, so those are the reasons we're here today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Scott for a few minutes. Okay. Um, so this um, uh, graphic here represents uh, kind of a, a fairly new model that has come out uh, for K-12 education, and it is being adopted by uh, organizations such as ISTE and, and I know the uh, MIT folks who are doing uh, AI in K-12 are really using this as kind of a model. So this is a model for teaching um, students AI, and I won't kind of go through it, but notice that the societal impact kind of is in the center of all these things. Um, now, this is kind of a, and I'll talk about this, uh, I think, on the next slide, uh, what we would call a cognitive view, understanding how AI works, just as in, you know, uh, traditional media literacy, you know, knowing how, you know, the, the languages of the different media helps us become more media literate if we understand more about uh, movies or TV or print and some of the tools. Uh, similarly, the more, you know, have a little computer science knowledge uh, and how AI works will help us be uh, more critical of consumers and, and producers. Uh, so. I just wanted to add um, some of these models that Scott has found, I think are really helpful when we're trying to break something down that's very big into some consumable pieces um, for our students as appropriate. All right, Scott's got okay. some other models to show so, us. Kind of connecting to what I just said about the, uh, I call it the Turetsky, uh, that's the author, the main author who came up with these big ideas, that, that model of uh, the big ideas in AI. Um, Kafai and her colleagues um, talk about computer science framing, and she separates them into critical, situated, and cognitive. Now, the diagram on the left is what is in her article, and this is the way that she frames it, is that, like I was saying, the cognitive is at the center. You need to have some knowledge of how it works in order to uh, look at things from different points of view. So briefly, the cognitive is, you know, let's learn this, how it works, the technical aspects. Situated is, uh, this is for computer science now, creating computer programs to be used for certain contexts. So on the right side, I created this Venn diagram of, and I think of them as more as overlapping. These are not mutually exclusive. And um, I've got some examples, and these examples are just may not be accurate, but it just provides a way of thinking about this. So for the cognitive frame, if I'm taking the advanced placements exam in computer science, I'm learning how to program, that's it. Um, if I'm trying, you know, things like games for change or technovation where uh, students are creating programs to, you know, for social good, that leans more towards the situated. And critical is looking at things, kind of the relationships between information and power. How does technology reinforce um, existing power structures and those kinds of things? So, um, and there is just kind of this overlap, but I think it's a really useful way to think of it because sometimes when people think about, well, we need to learn about AI, they may think about just about the technical aspects, but there's really kind of lots of ways uh, to think about it and it's not either or. But I think that's a really useful model as we think about um, AI literacy. Thank you, Scott. Um, I just really wanted to talk uh, and get your head around maybe some of the current things that people are thinking and publishing in the literature. Um, so a number of scholars have published some sort of dimensions, which kind of follows from Scott's you know, Venn diagrams of AI literacy. Um, we start with awareness, 
I, you know, what is it? When is it? And how do I encounter it? And we we start to gain knowledge about it. From there, we can go with attitudes. And you can see these scholars are sort of building these things up. Um, Wang et al., the newest, actually starts to add ethics onto that. Um, and for these sort of um, areas, um, this, this set of authors kind of put it into, you got to know and understand, use and apply, evaluate, and then ethics. So they're kind of building these knowledge areas around AI where we can start to think about what goes into each of those. And these are largely self-report measures, um, but there are other schemas that people are looking at measuring AI as well. Um, some look at very specific knowledge, you know, but a particular platform or a particular AI. And that's really limiting, I think, um, because there are commonalities ac ac across. And um, we also want to get away a little bit from self-report and observe the actual behavior of users. And that's a little more difficult, but certainly would capture more, um, I think, fidelity. Um, and Sky, I think, has really gotten into some um, actually uh, in our K-12 schools and beyond actually encountering algorithms, creating and coding algorithms. And we need also at the college level now to think about what do people need to know in their workplaces because so many workplaces employers are reporting that they use AI. And I think that's very underdeveloped. Uh, just as kind of a humorous interlude, I asked ChatGPT what AI literacy was, um, and it said some interesting things, but uh, not nearly as thorough as it would like to be. Um, they talked about recognizing our awareness, understanding potential, and making informed decisions, which all sounds great. Uh, and the purpose, I guess, is to better leverage, but also it did recognize that ethical and social implications are important. So that was kind of fun. I then asked it uh, what the AI literacy scale would look like, and it says there isn't one, but it did give these levels, which probably come from Scott and I think a couple of papers that we've, we've looked at, um, but these are some sort of the, the levels that we may get our, school, our, our students, whether they're adults or kindergartners, to try to get through. Okay, so that, yeah, that, that's just what ChatGPT told me. <laughs> <laughs> So, Scott, I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk a little bit about some of the deeper ideas you've encountered in your research. Right. So <clears throat> my um, my research uh, that I'm completing in the near future uh, was a case study with third and fourth graders uh, taught by a, their teacher uh, where the third and fourth graders were learning about uh, algorithmic bias and its um, potential societal harms. Now, all this was before chat GPT. So and I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, we all have generative AI and chat GPT on the brain, but AI has a, is, is all over the place and it's not just those technologies. So uh, this screen kind of represents an activity. I hope you're all familiar with that image on the right, which is from a documentary called Coded Bias, um, woman at MIT. Um, a doctoral researcher at the time found that the facial recognition uh, software did not work on darker skinned people, especially darker skinned women, and almost a half as a joke she put on the white mask, and it worked. Come to find out that uh, the training data was mostly white and Asian males. So one of the things, one of the ways to get at that, the idea that, okay, incomplete or biased training data can lead to biased algorithmic outputs, there's this great tool called uh, the Google Teachable Machine. And there's this animated GIF uh, flying in front of you there. So what you do, in this case, it's image recognition. So in this example, it's you know the woman's face or the, the stuffed animal. And then, uh, so you take the pictures, that's the training data. It does the training, this is free, by the way. And then you can see the output where it can, guesses to the best of its ability based on the data um you know how certain it is whether it's the face or the stuffed animal one activity that i've done is i i do this activity with a with a red apple and a green pear and you know then it distinguishes okay here's a red apple here's a green pear but then and it does pretty well but then i'll take a, a green apple and it thinks a green apple is a pear so you know, that's an interesting conversation. Why does the AI think this apple is a pear? And, you know, your first guess would be, well, it's, it's basing it mostly on color, but 
it's it's a it gets you thinking about kind of the workings of, of AI. You can go to the next that is slide. really cool. And here's another uh, activity. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the quote. I love it. It's from Katzi O'Neill from a book called Weapons of Math, Math Destruction. Uh, algorithms are opinions embedded in mathematics. Uh, this first one is an activity from uh, an author named Ailman. And this is the idea is that uh, you're in charge of starting a new planet. And you, you are writing a computer program to make sure only you know, good people get in. So I don't know if you're familiar with block-based coding, but if you look at it, it says, if the person has a criminal record, then they're out, okay? And if they don't have a criminal record, we keep them. So that could open up a discussion about, well, is that gonna, is that gonna work the way we want? What is, what's a criminal record? Is, is a speeding ticket a criminal record? Or there's all kinds of conversations that can come from that. So looking at real world scenarios, uh, that could be impacted by algorithms and how these kinds of algorithms um, could impact real people. And the final example is from uh, Das Gupta and Hill at MIT. And they had, I, I hope you're all familiar with Scratch, which is the block-based programming language, uh, kind of intended for students. But they had, they gave a certain group of students access to other people's data. And the students had to create their own ranking system. So this is basically a mathematical formula the kids had to create to say, okay, this is what I'm going to put at the top based on this formula. And in this case, it's like love it's plus favorites plus total views minus projects plus followers equals a number that in the higher the number, the higher the ranking. But again, it gives students that hands-on experience of that algorithms are opinions embedded in mathematics. What's the best? Well, according to this formula, this is the best. According to another formula, this one's the best. So... These are the kinds of, of hands-on experiences students uh, might have to, to get some AI literacy. I think that's it for that. Oh, and there's more. So this is uh, from the same authors at MIT, and these are kind of uh, generalizations based on what I just described, enabling connections to data. So depending on the students, that could be something like Google Teachable Machine, or there's another one called Google Quick Draw, which is simpler. Um, but if you can allow students to actually what's that? Ah, carajo. I don't know if that was a question or just someone left their mic on or not. But um so enabling connections to data, creating sandboxes, which allows students to create their own programs as I as with the um the ranking system I just showed, and then um just, you know, the last two really about making it authentic, you know, making it about real world type things. And this is this is what they have found for building um, critical algorithmic literacy. All right. Now we really want to turn it over to you for a good 25 minutes. Um, we've kind of looked at four different breakout rooms that you can choose from. Um, the first one is kind of the beginning and like basic AI literacy. What do you think the knowledge and awareness portion should be for all ages? And in, in thinking about these things, you can think about terms, facts, misconceptions, ideas, quotes, activities, and resources that fall under that particular area. And then we've divided critical media literacy, kind of that next couple of steps, um, into a K to eight and a nine plus, um, and I'll be hosting the, the room number three. So Jocelyn and Francia will host room one two, and then Scott, well, um, for some of the more advanced thinking, wants to host a room where we're talking specifically about teaching activities and production projects. Um, so I've created some Google Jam boards, and I really want you to record everything you can think of. If someone's talking and they say something great, create a sticky note on the Jam board. I'm going to put that Jam board link right here into the chat, um, so that. And if you haven't used a Google Jam board before, um, you simply click on the sticky note and type something, and then save it. And the facilitator can, you know, kind of help rearrange them, but. Anything that comes up that you think would be in there, and I'll be able to summarize those um, and get them back to the group um, via the Media Education Lab. Um, so for each group, we just want to think about what AI literacy means in this particular concept, context, how maybe we should measure it, and what are ideas for it. 
Um, so with no further ado, um, I would like to- Maybe some yes, further ado, God. Pam? Go right. ahead, further ado. Um, I just clicked on the Jamboard and I don't know if it's just me, but I don't have editing access. So I don't know if that's true for others. Fixed. Sure. <laughs> A little Is that better? Slightly. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I think that uh, either Jocelyn or our friend Jessica, oh, perfect, um, has given some rooms that we can choose to uh, go into. Um, so I will see you and we'll see you be back here at 4.50. Welcome back, everyone. I, I know that we still probably wanted more time, but I'd be very excited to just hear briefly from the facilitation leaders uh, and maybe we can take a look at our jam boards really quickly that came from each group. Um, so for breakout room one, um, was that you, Jocelyn? Yes, and definitely welcoming the rest of my group members to come off mic and share as well. We had a really good conversation that started with a great back and forth on, it depends on where you are in terms of what basic AI literacy looks like right now. In particular, whether there's a focus on computer literacy or content creation, and it seems like whatever the focus is, it seems to be leaving out a key portion. So it's not necessarily a holistic approach around the world just yet. Uh, and then we talked a lot about what it looks like to measure basic liter AI literacy as well. We had ideas on project based learning and how you can evaluate the entire process of someone's knowledge growth that way. Uh, the definite need for teacher training and librarian training and just getting everyone caught up. But that's really hard when everything seems to keep changing a lot, too. So I think we ended on the note of we just have to start somewhere and do the best that we can and get as much training and knowledge as we can because it's a lifelong growing process. Good. I see a lot of interesting things here that I'll try to wrap into the summary that I share um, via uh, Yanti has set up a uh, Google, um, and maybe you can drop that in the chat, where we're starting to collect uh, materials from these various sessions. Um, and I just, I really appreciate that you have some, some concrete things here. Um, I loved, you know, hey, the government needs to give us a push. So this is a really kind of where do we get started, and that's very helpful. Um, so I think we'll go to room three, which was my room, um, starting to talk about some more advanced things. I kind of have a flow I saw um, from, hey, gosh, there's some urgency around this. We really need to move. And then we recognized, I guess, in the middle, uh, some problems that we see and are encountering. And then we were trying to then move to the what do we do next, where this is invading our jobs. Um, where we're trying to go from reaction to pro proaction is that a word right proactiveness um a teaching maybe looking at what new jobs might develop as a part of this schema uh and you know inspiring people to actually care about this uh and you know look into it deeper which is always something we've struggled with with media literacy is you know, go find out where your information came from go think about this um, so we've got some good ideas here um, as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sky for your room and kind of tell me where the conversation led. So many different places, so many great places. Um, it's kind of hard to narrow it down, but I guess I'll we'll focus on things that we uh, would want to do with students. And we talked about certain resources that were out there. Um, the uh, media wise, Laura uh, presented media wise. I mentioned a resource that I just learned a lot more about today called uh, the MIT uh, Rays website, which has a, a wealth of a wealth of resources there. Um, I think it was um, oh gosh, was it Katie? We talked about uh, I love this idea. You know, there's a lot of fear about how do we teach you know generative AI, AI when it's blocked, but the online tool called Canva has a uh, a, a uh, text to image generation tool and uh so that's kind of a safe a safe environment to uh, do prompt engineering to have, uh, to have students type in uh, prompts to generate images um and uh let me see oh uh I like uh, it was Jeffrey's band saw analogy talked about back in back in our day we used to have shop classes and we had 
this, you know, dangerous, <laughs> dangerous tools like, uh, you know, electric saws and whatnot. And, uh, you know, you just teach the safety and you teach the tool. And, uh, and I thought that was, that was an effective uh, metaphor, but, um, and bringing context to tools, that is having students, you know, instead of the teacher saying, here's what we're, here's, here's the content we're going to focus on, since the kids are already immersed in um, AI and recommendation engines and, and generative AI that let them bring their experiences to it. And then they're going to be so much more connected because from what I'm hearing from teachers these days, their biggest challenge is students just feel disconnected from content. They feel disconnected from school. So they can bring their own content uh, as kind of a, a basis for what is going on in, in school. That I think that would be a huge, huge uh, step. And it's, if it's okay, if anybody else from that group wants to chime in, because I know I'm forgetting something important. I really like what's in the middle, the in real life. Uh, let's get our <laughs> hands on it. You know, uh, somebody in my group said, hey, you know, uh, there's that, you know, three little pigs, big bad wolf. There's other stories out there. Let's dig into what ChatGPT says about the three little pigs. What do you think about that? Um, you know, and then moving into the upper grades of actually developing a small AI that filters things and seeing, you know, what what does that feel like? How does that help me understand what's going on in my life? Um, so as I said, um, there is a Google Doc that is um, being being created to encompass these discussions. So I'll try to, to summarize some of this. Um, I'd like to just end with, um, where is my... Eek, my share screen one more time. Um, um, there's a there's a few recommended resources that it's gotten I felt were particularly important. Um, the ISTE has come out with an AI guide for K-12 that looks really great. UNESCO just came out with a guide for AI in higher education. Um, Scott has mentioned the MIT uh, ethics curriculum. Uh, and then code.org has everything from short lessons to a huge lesson uh, to enable students to get their hands on. And you particularly mentioned this, you know, create an AI that cleans the oceans and all the things it can run into that you don't think of when you first design it. Um, so these are things I think can help students get in the mindset to prepare them not only to use AI, but maybe to be creating AI in the future and seeing applications beyond cheating on homework. Um, so hopefully that helps. And again, we will add these. And if you have other things you see, particularly well-developed lesson plans that you can just take and use, that's appreciated. So we are at the hour. Um, and I want to give it back to Jocelyn because I'm sure she has just a couple of things she needs to say. Yes, yes. Thank you both so much. This was such a good conversation. I feel like a lot of questions came up that maybe we don't even have answers for yet, but it's a lot to think about going forward. For those that are going to join us at the next session, that is May 15th at 12 p.m. Eastern time, and we're going to talk prompt engineering. I see Catherine with her hands up. She's going to be one of our leaders for that session. It's going to be a great conversation, so please be sure to join. I'm also dropping in our chat my contact information if you want to follow up with me or have questions about the session, as well as the main link on the Media Education Lab page where we're going to put all the recordings of these sessions too. So if you miss it, you can still participate in that discussion, still participate in that knowledge growth. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>